Okay, so this next presentation is from our friends at Meta, um, who are also got a fairly similar theme to what we've just been hearing about getting OpenGL running on Vulkan. So um, with no further ado, well, let's hear from Sergey, uh, what's his last name, Kos uh, Kosarevsky. And let's see if this hey. I'm a software engineer and the Vulkan tech lead Meta. Today we're going to talk about how to use Bindless to quickly port Bindful OpenGL applications to Vulkan. Quick aside about myself, besides being a Vulkan tech lead at Meta, I'm a former Ubisoft rendering lead, and my passion for graphics and gaming technology is reflected in my contributions to the field. I co-authored three books on 3D graphics and gaming. If you're interested in learning more, you can find my books available on Amazon. Today, I will be talking about our project and its migration to Vulkan. We call it the Intermediate Graphics Library, or IGL for short. It is a cross-platform umbrella API, which abstracts away different flavors of OpenGL and Metal. We have many internal clients which use our library, and in total, we are supporting more than 20 internal and external projects. Our library runs on Windows, Linux, Mac, iOS, and Android, and it really treats all these platforms as first-person citizens. We have a very long history of supporting different versions of OpenGL, starting from OpenGL ES2 and going all the way to OpenGL 4.1, which used to be running on Mac. Now we support Metal on Mac. We want to quickly add Vulkan 1.3 support. And we want the possibility to backport all of this to Vulkan 1.1 with some extensions. Let's take a closer look at what this API looks like. It was modeled after the Metal API had a strong influence from OpenGL. The render command encoder interface has functions that allow you to bind buffers, textures, and samplers individually to specific binding slots, similar to how gel bind texture binds a texture to a target. To accomplish all of this, you would need to write complicated Vulkan descriptor set management code, making a rapid prototyping a challenging process. To save time and effort, we can utilize Vulkan bindless features instead of writing descriptor set management code. Bindless in Vulkan refers to the support of two extensions, buffer device address and descriptor indexing. These extensions have been promoted to the core Vulkan 1.2, and starting from Vulkan 1.3, they are guaranteed to be supported. In my presentation, I'm assuming that everyone is familiar with the descriptor indexing tutorials, so I won't be covering how these extensions work. Instead, I will be showing how we can utilize them to efficiently implement the render command encoder interface. Our C++ implementation is divided into two parts. The high-level part implements the functions of the render command encoder class. The low-level part interacts with the Vulkan API. Let's take a look at the high-level part first. For the purpose of the slides, any sanity checks and assertions have been excluded. This is the pseudocode for a bind buffer function. It is capable of handling all types of buffers, but vertex buffers require special treatment. The handling of other buffers, such as shader storage and uniform buffers, is done within the low-level C++ code through the binder object. The other bind functions in the render command encoder simply make a direct call to the binder object. In the actual production code, they perform additional checks, such as verifying the validity of the objects and ensuring that the binding slot index meets alignment requirements. Before creating a draw call, we transfer our binding data to the GPU using dynamic uniform buffers. In a few slides, we will examine how the low-level code operates. And here, once the binding data for the draw code has been updated, we can execute the actual Vulkan drawing commands. This was a brief overview of the role of the render command encoder class. Now let's take a look at the low-level C++ implementation that prepares the data for Vulkan. The resources binder class is responsible for managing all bindings. Each binding slot is a structure that holds a texture, a sampler, and a buffer. The textures and samplers are stored as integer indices into a large descriptor set that includes arrays for all textures, known as sampled images in Vulkan, and all samplers. Buffers are accessed using 64-bit addresses. 
All these binding slots are organized into an array within the binding structure. This structure is transferred to the GPU using dynamic uniform buffers. The binding functions update the array on the CPU side and the GPU upload only occurs prior to a draw call. It is important to note that if you want to make this OpenGL wrapper as simple as possible, you can stop listening right now and just use push constants instead of dynamic uniform buffers. However, this would prevent the use of push constants for other purposes and would also limit the possible number of binding slots due to the maximum allowed size of push constants, which is just 128 bytes on many Vulkan implementations. Let's see how to go forward with dynamic uniform buffers. To grasp how this code works with Vulkan, let's examine our descriptor set layouts. We only handle two of them, and they are shared by all Vulkan pipelines and shaders in our system. The first descriptor set layout describes an array of sampled images for all our textures, an array of samplers for all our samplers, and a separate array of storage images. We utilize the descriptor indexing features to dynamically update the descriptor sets. This is just a standard way of doing so in Vulkan. The second descriptor set layout describes a dynamic uniform buffer. We have a separate layout for it because Vulkan does not allow mixing descriptor indexing and dynamic uniform buffers in one layout. Let's examine this diagram that illustrates how our binding data is organized within dynamic uniform buffers. Dynamic uniform buffers have size limitations on many Vulkan implementations, so we use multiple buffers to fit all our bindings. We choose 64 kilobytes, that is a common size. Our binding structure is 256 bytes, allowing us to fit 256 bindings in each dynamic uniform buffer. We write to a dynamic uniform buffer only if a slot in the bindings has changed from the previous draw call. We maintain a separate set of dynamic uniform buffers for each swap chain image, preventing us from overwriting data that may still be in use by the GPU. And we don't need any extra GPU to CPU synchronization in this case. With all our data structures set up, we can now upload the bindings data to the GPU. This pseudocode shows how, with some sanity checks submitted for simplicity. It only executes if the binding data has changed since the last draw call. As you can see, we switch to the next dynamic uniform buffer when we've run out of space for more bindings in the current buffer. The buffers are allocated in the host visible memory, allowing us to use memcopy to make the data accessible to the GPU. Once the data is copied, we bind the descriptor sets with the current buffer offset, making the desired binding accessible to the shaders. Dynamic uniform buffers have alignment requirements for the offset parameter, which we must observe. Now that we've covered the C++ side, let's examine the shader code and see how it can access our binding data. Now let's discuss shaders. Our IGL library has two code paths for handling shaders. The first code pass utilizes our proprietary shading language, SparkSL. This language compiles code into SphereV, GLSL, or metal shading language. And this is the most used method in production as it allows for writing shaders once and then compiling them for every API. The second code pass involves taking in backend specific shaders written in GLSL and utilizing the JSLAN compiler from Kronos to generate SPRV code. This is mainly used for quick prototyping within the company and to debug our SparkSL compiler by comparing it against JSLAN. Let's delve a bit deeper into our JLSL code path. Before sending the shader code to JSLAN, we inject a set of data structures and helper functions into the JLSL source code. The GLSL binding structure is essentially a binary representation of the binding structure from C++. And these functions abstract away all the descriptor indexing machinery and allow us to write GLSL code as if we are working with fixed binding slots for textures and centers. 
For example, a shader can access a 2D texture and the sampler by calling the texture sample 2D function, specifying necessary binding slots. We read the binding information from a dynamic uniform buffer and use non-uniform indexing to access the actual texture and sampler using the descriptor indexing. JLSL and SPRB allow us to alias the arrays of different texture types into the same binding inside one descriptor set. This simplifies the C++ code which updates the descriptor set. The binding code to access buffers can use buffer device addresses directly. We store buffer references as unsigned vectors instead of 64-bit integers because many Vulkan implementations lack support of 64-bit integers inside uniform buffers. And with that, we finished our discussion on the implementation of our OpenGL wrapper and our OpenGL apps using Vulkan. And as a bonus, the approach outlined in this presentation is compatible with Molten VK as well. The only limitation is that the metal shading language does not permit aliasing of resources within a single binding point in the descriptor set. However, this limitation can easily be addressed by de-aliasing descriptors and using separate binding points for each resource type, such as 1D textures, 2D textures, cube maps, and so on including different binding points for texture arrays of different types. While this approach is straightforward to implement, it requires more code on the C++ side to manage the LS descriptor sets. So that's all I have. Thank you for listening to the presentation.